Hi, this is your host, Sapna Bharatiya. And once again, we have with us Alex Kirkop, Chief Product Architect at Akamai. Alex, it's great to have you back on the show. Always great to talk to you, Swap. Yeah, and we are starting a brand new series on open source. So there are a lot of topics to talk about. Uh, for the first episode, I would you know, prefer to just do some of the basics to understand about you, Akamai, and the role that you folks are playing in the open source world. So I'll start with you. Talk a bit about your own background, specifically in the open source world. I'm probably giving away too much about my age, but my open source days started in the early days of Linux when you'd bought it, you'd, you'd, you'd get a distribution and get like 30 floppy disks to, to use to install in your in your environment. Um, and in the early days of the internet, um, you know, setting up web servers and proxy servers and, and, and various uh, networking. Um, so I, I think it's probably fair to say a lot of my career has been dependent on, you know, uh, the open source ecosystem, the open source tooling, and most recently, of course, I've been uh, very active with the CNCF and and have been uh, volunteering time and working with with the CNCF and, and their vast ecosystem uh, as well, which which has been um, in general always very rewarding, uh, great to ex be able to exchange ideas and new technology uh, in the open source space. Um, so it's not just about, you know, using open source and having it as part of the, your tool set, but it's, it's, it's all about the people as well. And, and the people are, are kind of magical in this open source space. And if you look at your own career, your own history, how have you seen open source evolve? Of course, uh, you know, on the days or open source, it's, we are not even talking about whether enterprises or you know companies should do that as a solved thing. But as more and more companies are getting involved, uh, if you look at the very early days of open source, we have to go and educate why they should become a good open source citizen, why should they should play a role if they can. I mean, it's not really important for or necessary for you to, because not everybody has all the resources, so you can do whatever you can do, you know, fetch water, that's what the whole saying goes, you know, in the open source world. But uh, from a large picture, how you have seen the open source world evolve in terms of core contribution, quality of contribution, ecosystem, the whole, you know, uh, community uh, from the early days of open source and where we are now? It's it's an interesting question. And, and I think contributions have changed over time. You know, I think um, just about every single company in some way or another consumes open source, right? Whether it's um, things like the Linux operating system or various languages that they might be using for their own software development stacks, which which might be open source. Um, but the main, you know, the 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 the, the main difference I think that we that we've seen is in in those very early days, there was more of a bias perhaps to maintainers and contributors. I think nowadays we see uh, we've, we've seen kind of a, a little bit of a transformation where. A number of uh, companies still contribute to open source, but they also contribute um, to the ecosystem by, for example, sponsoring foundations and, and other organizations that in turn then foster the ecosystem. So I think it's, it's, it's a multi-pronged approach in terms of how enterprises today and, and companies today contribute to open source. Some are building um, uh, some are building products which are very open source based and they're using open source as a way of um, uh, building traction for their for their software products. Um, others are consuming uh, open source in their in their stack and and perhaps contributing fixes or changes or, or, or new features to those to those open source and helping maintain the open source. Um, and others yet are, are you know, contributing to um, one or more of the different foundations, uh, whether they're sort of local community foundations or, or some of the larger foundations like the CNCF. One more thing is that in early days of open source, it was more or less like uh, 
folks used to work at night in their free time while they have their full-time corporate job. Linux Foundation, they used to run a lot of you know uh, studies also, and over a period of time, we start seeing that a lot of these developers are moving on companies' payrolls, where they are working on those projects in the daytime, not they're not moonlighting as an open source developer. Uh, what kind of uh, corporate involvement you're seeing, and what does it mean for open source? Because there's also a misconception that there's open source versus commercial work. That is not the case. Open source and commercial. Without commercial support, open source will not survive. You have, we have seen all those successful open source projects which have commercial backing or commercial product. They have a better chance of sustainability versus purely, you know, we work on those projects on free time. So talk about the corporate side of open source. So that's interesting. I, I think we're, see, we're certainly seeing um, an evolution in terms of, uh, in terms of how corporate uh, uh, environments deal and, and, and interact with open source. So at a, very, at a very simplistic level, you know, what you mentioned around people doing open source in part time, um, and then over time, that evolving into people having paid positions to do open source. That is certainly true. Although, I think it's probably fair to say that um, the vast majority of open source maintainers are probably still doing it um, as a as a part time or sort of in their own time. You know, I think we do see um, we do see open source projects which are uh, the foundation of startups, and that's a very different uh, situation. You know, so so we have startups, especially in in the more recent cloud native ecosystem, where where the entire uh, modus operandi of the of the company is to to build an open source product, and then they're commercializing that open source uh, project, perhaps with enterprise add-ons or, or, or support functionality, etc. And, and in those cases, then you, you're, you're moving into a situation where uh, the maintainers are, are working full time. Um, of course, you also have, you know, the big, very widely popular projects, you know, think something like Kubernetes, where you have uh, dozens, if not hundreds of organizations that are contributing codes to to a shared code base that that's that's then used by by all. You know, Linux is is another good example of this, but there are also lots of um, uh, networking tools or, or service meshes or things, projects like Envoy, for example, in this sort of space where you have maintainers from lots of different uh, organizations contribute to the code, and then those 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 sort of projects do tend to get like. Once they get to a certain critical mass, it's obviously much easier to attract maintainers and much easier to attract um, both part-time and full-time developers into this mix. So, so I think there's there's a complete spectrum, basically. In summary, you know, I, I still think the vast majority of open source maintainers um, do this because they're passionate about you know a particular problem or a particular project, and they and they want to work on it. Uh, the lucky ones get to work on this full time in organizations, but then now more recently we've we've seen uh, organizations that that actually develop open source as their main as their main product, and that includes you know database providers like CockroachDB and Mongo, as well as um, you know large um, uh, large products in the in the cloud native ecosystem. So so we're seeing it we're seeing it sort of contribute to that business model as well, but of course. That business model um, and the way uh, those corporates then commercialize those open source projects does lead to, um, you know, various uh, complexities because because commercializing those open source solutions um, isn't always an easy thing, and therefore we end up with sort of peaks and troughs in terms of the amount of resources and money that corporates put into. Uh, open source at any given time. And can you also not talk about uh, Akamai? How are you folks engaged uh, in different open source projects? And also, how do you look at open source? So Akamai um, has three main uh, uh, sort of business pillars. We have the delivery network and the CDN, which is which is perhaps what what Akamai was 
most traditionally uh, known for. We have uh, the security pillar, um, which includes a variety of services in the uh, in the in the networking space for uh, providing security for APIs or say denial of, of uh, service prediction. Um, and we then have our cloud compute uh, pillar, which is providing you know a fully uh, a fully fledged cloud service for for our customers. Um, and in each of those pillars, I think it's fair to say that open source underpins um, uh, just about all of those all of those technologies in the in the uh, network and the CDN uh, business. We've worked very hard on optimizing uh, Linux for those network flows. Um, we've developed uh, open source solutions like um, Akamai's Flow IPC that allow um, that, that allow us to to expand and scale our, our uh, CDN and networking type solutions in an open source way. We we obviously do lots of work with in, within the security space and uh, things like certificates and KMI and other open source related to that. So, for example, um, Akamai is quite well known for being one of the founders of um, the Let's Encrypt uh, Certificate Authority service. Um, we we work on and then when we look at our cloud compute uh, environment, um, we we obviously are very big contributors again both in the Linux space and in the um, and in the cloud native ecosystem. So you know apart from being uh, very uh, uh, very active members in the CNCF, um, we've also we're also very very proud actually to to have contributed. Um, a million dollars of credits to help the CNCF projects uh, and the CNCF uh, ecosystem, and and that's because we're dependent on such a wide variety of uh, cloud native projects, including things like Kubernetes and Envoy and uh, the different service meshes like Cilium and Istio and various other items in the observability stack and secrets management and certificate management. So, so it's probably fair to say that 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 open source underpins. Um, uh, the vast majority of, of, of our technology at this stage. Now, when we look at open source, there are two open sources. First of all, of course, pure projects that folks can use. Uh, and then when we talk about open source uh, involvement, it's about uh, contributing to the specific project. The other side of open source is also uh, we can compare it with farming, you know, as a farmer, you can grow potatoes, you know, so you can say, hey, this is, but then there's other industry like whole transportation that takes that potato there, restaurant chains, delivery guys, you know, so without this whole ecosystem, farmers can do nothing with potatoes. The same way I look at uh, open source also, uh, and sometimes, you know, it, it, of course, it may not be the right way to say, but supporting supporting open source even if you are not doing that much code contribution, but enabling people to consume it without worrying about things is also a way of contribution. Uh, so talk about how Akamai is leveraging a lot of open source you know, technologies to build its own services that the whole world is using so that we also talk about that side of open source that we don't much talk about because we sometimes have a very myopic view. And there is nothing wrong with that view also that open source means direct contribution. No, it also means the second layer where we kind of make open source more consumable. Yeah, that, that's that's very true. So, so you know, Akamai um, works a lot in the ecosystem and contributes to the open source, but it also consumes um, the open source. And, and that kind of actually creates like a symbiotic relationship, right? So, for example, um, whilst we consume lots of open source, like I mentioned, we build a lot of our business on on the cloud native ecosystem, the Linux ecosystem, the the, the security and and uh, SSL libraries and certificates and all of these things. Um, we also contribute uh, different uh, open source to the environment. So we have. Um, uh, open source projects like um, Flow IPC, which is used in our CDN network, which is which is a key building block. 
Um, we're, we also have um, Fingerbank, which is one of the industry's uh, largest device fingerprinting uh, repositories, which is used by lots of networking companies as well as uh, other service providers. We're the founding members of Let's Encrypt that provides all of the um, certificates that effectively, you know, drive um, this, both the security and, and the uh, the ingress and accessibility of, of, you know, networks all around the world, hundreds of thousands of networks. Um, but we also do this uh, very actively in our in our cloud environment. So, so you know, the the Linode and the Akamai cloud uh, business lines, you know, have a very strong belief in contributing to open source. So, for example, our APIs, our cloud manager, our um, uh, our storage drivers, network drivers, Terraform drivers, all of those sorts of things are, are, are all open source. And that, and that helps in two ways, right? You know, it's, 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 not, um, it's not purely altruistic. It, it also helps um, with uh, the support of our product. It helps with customer interactions. It makes it easier to, to build on that ecosystem. It makes it easier to, for people to contribute to that ecosystem. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's that's where where all of this uh, comes together because then whilst we also consume those open source uh, you know quite a variety of open source products we also you know upstream uh, some of those uh, open source changes as we develop features in those products so for example contributing to uh, to envoy or contributing to to linux and up, and upstreaming you know perhaps bug fixes or tunings or or network optimizations and, and things like that now when we look at open source of course the easiest part is a company takes the code claims it release it on open source you know it's throw on the wall and then go take care of it or you know you can actively maintain it uh, at the same time we are, there are also a lot of foundations where you can put the code there and now uh, yes you do lose some control over the code but now the code is maintained by a larger ecosystem which also breeds confidence even among your competitors because they don't have to worry about you changing the license tomorrow uh, it has a much bigger uh, you know kind of uh, ecosystem at the same time i may be wrong but I feel that open source is very little about the code. It's more about the community. It's more about the collaboration because that is the tricky part. Anybody can sit in the basement and write code. So can you talk about the role and importance of neutral foundations or neutral places to put the code so we don't have to worry about, I mean, last year we saw, this year also, you know, a lot of companies, they change their licenses and suddenly the same product is not what it used to be. So talk about the importance of these neutral organizations for the sustainability of open source. So, so there's a few, um, there's a few items to touch on there. You know, when, a, when somebody first creates an open source project and, and releases it, you know, assuming it's not originally from a company, um, it takes a mixture of luck and you know, community to actually, you know, gain traction, right? Um, so when we think of um, foundations, there are a number of different uh, things that the foundation contributes to the to the ecosystem. The first is obviously it, it gives you a nice neutral home um, for the for the IP, for the code, for the for the open source uh, software. Um, and but more importantly, at least in my opinion, and, and sort of with all the work that that we've done, say with the CNCF, where where we're now um, funding, where we're now sort of hosting hundreds of projects, um, one of the big things is the ability to help uh, mature the project in terms of one, you know, how the project is is governed and how the maintainers and and how uh, making it easy to to have uh, a roadmap and and the ability for new maintainers to to join the the, the project to begin with, um, but it also helps foster a little bit of that community, mostly by you know giving the project uh, visibility that perhaps it would be hard to get otherwise, um, and it also gives you know uh, it, it it allows the project to kind of go through maturity stages. So most foundations have uh, a number of different uh, 
uh, maturity levels for, for the project. So for example, if we take the CNCF as an example, projects uh, can join the CNCF at a sandbox level where it's it's mostly experimental. They're, the projects um, uh, are, are helping build uh, the community and they're kind of trying to find their feet and trying to, 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 to get a, a critical mass of adoption. And then they move into an incubation stage where they're used in production and they're live in production and, and they have a number of um, uh, different production users that can provide use cases. Um, and they have, you know, standard release cycles and, and, you know, a lot more project maturity in that respect. And then you finally get to sort of a graduated stage where um, there is, it, we, we ensure uh, that there are multiple maintainers from different organizations contributing to the project, that the project has the appropriate, you know, security overview and security audits and things like that to kind of then give, you know, that, that ultimate uh, stamp of approval that, 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 that the project is, is uh, you know, very safe to use in, in, in most use cases. Um, and so projects kind of go through that life cycle and by, by being part of the foundation, they, they grow and they mature and they add the different levels of, of, uh, of uh, adoption and maturity uh, to their governance and to the development of the product and the usage of the product. Um, but unfortunately, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that, you know, a project is going to be successful or a project can be continued to be funded, right? We have seen quite challenging uh, market conditions over the last couple of years. You know, there have been lots of startups that have um, created open source that have had challenging times and some startups have been acquired and the project changes or some startups have gone through tough times and, and have had to uh, focus on uh, commercializing or, 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 you know, generating revenue out of the projects. And I think this is something that we're that, that we're seeing as as a, as an ongoing transition in this space. Um, I think lots of uh, lots of companies love creating open source and, and putting uh, you know and, and having uh, open source projects because it certainly makes it easier for their product to get adopted. It, it lowers the barriers to entry. It makes uh, it easy for developers and uh, and platform engineers, etc., to 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 try the software very easily. Um, but in in the software world, it's actually quite hard to sell licenses nowadays, right? We, we, we've moved away from a we've moved away from an environment where software is delivered as a license that somebody buys a license, consumes a license in that way. Um, and in many cases, we've moved to a mode where uh, organizations consume services rather than the software licenses, right? So they they consume a, a SaaS service, for example. So for example, you might have an open source project, which is open source, um, but then there are some enterprise features or there are some some services that are sold as a SaaS service to to an enterprise and, and that's how the backing organization makes makes their revenue. But in <clears throat> but in, in recent times we've seen some challenges in that space too, especially in some of the you know more traditional cloud native uh, uh, and, and Linux areas because it's actually not that easy to create, a SaaS solution for some of these products. If you're building a service mesh, well, you have to install the service mesh in your own cluster. You can't, you know, purchase that as a service, uh, which is, say, very different from, for example, when you compare it to, say, a database. It's quite easy to buy databases as a service in, in the cloud, and it's quite easy for those database open source companies to commercialize their software that way, for example. But when you're talking about, say, a service mesh and observability stack and various other things, some of those things aren't uh, natural to, to provide as a service. And, and I think those companies now are having a bit of a reckoning where they're having to figure out, can they be pure open source? Are they just going to make it source available, but not actually allow you to use the open source to build your own things. 
uh, and various other combinations, you know, that, that might be going, that, that, that might happen as we go along. And, you know, your, <laughs> your analogy around, uh, in the question around, you know, farmers and, and, and versus the transport agents and, and all of those things, um, it's actually an analogy I've used before uh, when, when discussing open source. You know, I think there is the, the, if we look at farmers, farmers get a small amount of money for the food they, they generate. You know, the, the, the amount of money per kilo of food they generate is actually relatively small compared to, for example, the amount of money you pay in a restaurant for exactly the same amount of food. Right. And, and that's because there are many layers of intermediaries and value adds in the process. And that's exactly what's happening with, with some of these open source solutions. The maintainers are getting very, very little money, sometimes no money at all. And then various levels of service providers later, uh, that's where the money is being made. And so I, I kind of think that there has to be a bit of a reckoning in the way some of these licenses evolve, especially the ones which are tied into, into services and service providers. But I also think it, it comes back to, you know, how do we deal with these sort of problems in, in, the, in the traditional world? So, you know, most governments in some way or another provide subsidies to farmers. They provide uh, various uh, incentives uh, for farmers to make it worth their while. And why did they do that? Because governments determined that, well, food needs to be cheap and they want to have good quality food available for their populations, right? And I think we're, we're, we're kind of coming to a place where um, through foundations, through endowments, through educational organizations and universities, etc., we'll start seeing this sort of approach where um, open source gets partially funded or perhaps subsidized by some of these um, uh, more holistic approaches to, to looking at open source for, for the main reason that the, this open source is going to be so critical for uh, everything, every part of, 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 a, of a country's environment. Um, and that is no, most important in places like AI, for example, where we're seeing a huge uh, transition uh, to, to a new type of technology which needs to be you know, driven by open source. But perhaps that's a topic for another day. <laughs> Since we are talking about, you know, some like fundamentals of open source for this first episode, so there is one thing that we do need to talk about, which is challenges. We have talked about the rosy picture, but what are the challenges that you see? Of course, we can talk about as we talked about, you know, license change companies, but there may be a lot of other issues, you know, looking at your own deeper involvement in open source that we may not even hear of. So what are the issues related to open source that keeps you worried? Certainly, uh, you know, some of the challenges I think that are top of mind include some of the license changes and some of the evolving licenses that, that we've talked about. I, I think that unpredictability makes organizations uh, nervous because they can build a huge dependency on something and then, you know, the project might change direction. Of course, this has always been the case. But I, I guess some of the market dynam dynamics have, have made a few high profile uh, license changes uh, more prominent and, and it's, it's become more top of mind. Um, of course, like you mentioned, you know, there is also the challenge that not all open source is actually open source and certain companies um, might uh, look to open source to just do marketing or to help build their business model, but but actually, you know, they're not necessarily, um, they're not looking at it as, as a community driven uh, approach. You know, it's 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 just their work that they're that they're working on, and they don't actually, um, uh, they don't actually want perhaps other uh, people to control or to or to contribute to the to the open source. Um, we met, we touched a little bit on AI, but AI is definitely uh, an interesting challenge. Um, we have certainly a mix of proprietary and different flavors of open source that we're beginning to see uh, with AI. 
combined with uh, an interesting and completely uneven regulatory fr framework that's you know very different in the US versus the UK versus the EU versus Asia. Um, and and I think that is going to that is going to um, iterate and change very very quickly over time because uh, because AI is obviously driving uh, a monumental amount of investment uh, in the space and, and is therefore going to uh, trigger a lot of you know policy and uh, and and regulation in the space um, and then you know finally I think we have you know the challenges that actually. We spent a few years during uh, zero interest rates um, where there was uh, an overabundance of capital. There was an overabundance of uh, VC money flowing into startups that allowed them to be adventurous and allowed them to develop a lot of open source. Um, and sometimes now that's that's been changing given you know the different market dynamics. Um, and I think what we are seeing is because of those different market dynamics, we're, we're definitely seeing um, a change in approach in in the ways some of the new startups are now thinking about open source and how they work. Um, that possibly sounds um, more worrying than I intended it to be, because in actual fact, when I look at um, you know the work that. Uh, that we're doing, say, in the CNCF, and the number of projects that are continuing to uh, to be released and, and join the foundation, that certainly hasn't seen um, any dip in in popularity. So, so I think it's fair to say that whilst there are hiccups and there are evolutions in the way that we think about open source, the open source ecosystem is. Uh, in very good health and certainly uh, moving at a very fast pace. Alex, thank you so much for joining me today and of course talk about open source. Thanks for great insights and I look forward to our next episode. Thank you. Thank you too. As always, it's been an amazing experience.